Hi, I'm Joel H. Brewster, and I'm no stranger to horror. And this is a podcast where I discuss the big and the small of the genre with the hopes to take you from being a casual horror fan to a person like myself who's a spooky film fanatic. With me today, I have a very special guest to talk about one of my favorite horror zombie movies. The movie we'll be discussing is the film Little Monsters from 2019. And with me today, I have my favorite person in the world, my wife, Jennifer Brewster, who runs her own daycare. So she knows very much about little monsters of ourselves, including our own daughter, Ava, who's two years old. Uh, Jenny, how are you doing? I am good. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm doing great. We're That's recording awesome. in the same house, just in <laughs> completely different rooms. Because no, no, no. Keep the illusion. The illusion that we have a huge, <laughs> yeah, actually we have a huge studio. So I'm in my studio. I'm actually at our summer house. <laughs> and Jenny's in our summer house. So this is working out really great so far. <laughs> so Jenny, I've seen the movie before. So this is my second time viewing it. How did you feel about your first time viewing it? I... I have to say, I think you amped it up a lot. So I was Mm -hmm. kind of thinking that it maybe wouldn't be as good as you were saying it was. Totally fair. But I loved it. I really loved it. I thought it was amazing. Made me cry. It made me laugh. I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic movie. I'm really happy to hear that. Because usually my recommendations can, like you said, they can be amped up a lot because I get very excited. And then they can just fall flat. Yeah, more times than not. But this time I have to say you did well. So I want you to tell me about your history with horror. And I have some questions because I've done some research into, into you as my wife, who I've been with for almost <laughs> 10 years now, but I have still want to do some research to kind of, you know, get more into who Jenny is. Oh. So from my understanding from a reliable source that your first horror film that really spooked you was the film, The Exorcist. It was The Exorcism of Emily Rose oh. was the first one that spooked me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, you know how bad my memory is for movies and which one came out first. So you can actually tell me which one came out first. It was that one and Echoes. I feel like Echoes may have been the one that actually came out first. And those are the two movies that stood up for me as um, being the most um, influential on me wanting to like horror. The one that maybe turned me off the most was my actual first experience with watching horror, which was the poltergeist when I was six and my mom left for the very first time. Um, She went to a funeral in Scotland and left us with our dad, who um, is just a big child, was just a big child. So he decided to get us McDonald's for dinner, take us to the grocery store and just let us go get ice cream get candy get chips get chocolate get pop get whatever you want but he got to choose the movie so he chose poltergeist pushed the couch right up to the tv and forced six-year-old me and eight-year-old my sister to watch poltergeist and I spent the whole film behind the couch begging him to turn it off and he thought it was hysterical so through that trauma, I think I got desensitized and uh, actually ended up loving horror. And then I watched The Echoes and then I watched The Exorcism of Ellie Rose. And those were the two that just totally set me on the path of loving horror. I appreciate your dad starting you young. Uh, in my research, <laughs> I, I, I asked her sister. Your sister said it was The Exorcist, but I'm, oh. I think she just messed up the title. She did, um, yes, a poultry face. See, she's like, also traumatized. She's exactly. just like, I don't know. There was death. It was horror. I don't know. With it, that, is poltergeist. it was poltergeist with that said was it specifically the scene with the worm in the tequila bottle that traumatized yes you? yes yeah I thought that was the scariest scariest thing I've ever seen I mean obviously there were so many things that led up to that moment but that was the one that was awful and then I grew up and realized that not all tequila has worms in it and nor does it have like jumbo worms in it I don't know it was it was scary it was scary through the lens of like the back of the couch. It was a very scary movie to watch at six. <laughs> That's fair. On that same token, because as parents, as well, I was going to say we're new parents, but now we've had Ava for two years. Um, as parents, do you find that sometimes kids do very like spooky things in the middle of the oh, night? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, we've said this a lot, but I think children doing anything in the darkness that is somewhat abnormal to be doing in the darkness just maybe it's because of how much horror we've watched is just 
so scary, so, so scary. Like just sitting up in the bed is enough to spook me, which is like <laughs> not, not necessarily actually a very scary thing, but in the darkness to just see a young child sit up and not talk and not move is enough for me to be like, they're possessed. <laughs> You know, it'd be really scary. And I, from my understanding, you used to do this is sleepwalking. Yes. I heard that you were a notorious sleepwalker and you could be found <laughs> in bathtubs, under beds. Yeah. Almost at the front door. Is this true? Yeah. My mom woke up multiple times to little five-year-old me standing at the foot of their bed in complete silence, completely still. And personally I love my child obviously more than anything in the entire world but I would contemplate giving me away like that to be like that you have crossed the boundary of being an okay member in this family um yeah I don't know how my mom did it I I think I think it's a testament to how much she loved me that she allowed me to stay in the house even though I did that a lot. I left the house in my sleep. I woke up in the bathtub. Well, she woke me up in the bathtub a lot. Multiple times they found me under my bed. Just a lot of really creepy stuff. I would for sure not be okay with that. So I hope Ava doesn't get that because, um, yeah, that's going to test me as a mother. That's for sure. It's a really testament to a nineties house too, because our house would be like impossible for her to try, try to escape from. Cause it's got so many of like the modern locks and stuff like that that I think it'd be like that if she got out I'd be like oh she was kidnapped because our house has so many modern locks that yeah and alarms and stuff right like yeah Mm -hmm. we didn't have any alarms I think we just had like we had a deadbolt lock lock and that was it for the time that I escaped so thankfully mother's instinct she happened to hear the click of the door and didn't I mean, I guess at that point she had so many years of me doing weird stuff that I guess in her head, she was like, whoa, I better go check. Like always hypervigilant. Yeah. But then she found me all the way at the end of the path and she said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to see my friends at school. And like, thank God she found me because not that much further of a walk and I would have been straight on the highway. So <laughs> God, but I don't know. And this was in know. Calgary, right? No, this, that one was in the Middle East that that one happened. Yeah. 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 And we had just moved there as well. So that really scared my mom because she was like, oh my God, if I had woken up, I, I mean, I was only eight. I don't know if anywhere in the world I would have known how to get back home. But at that point, I think we'd only been living there about a month. So she was like, oh my God, how scary would that be? Because if I'd woken up, I wouldn't have even known like our phone number. I didn't know her phone number at that point. So obviously that would have been a whole lot scarier than had it being in a place where I'd lived for long enough that I would have known neighbors, I would have known our phone number. So that kind of spooked her a lot to the point of when we moved to Switzerland on my first week that we were there, our door had a key lock, like our bedroom doors had key locks. And my mom locked me in to my room at night, just to be sure (laughs) that, that I didn't escape. And I was like 13, no, 11 at that point, but she's still locked me in and I don't blame her I think I found a lot of relief in that actually at the beginning to be locked in so oh absolutely yeah yeah so creepy children yeah what made you uh what because I know you so I know that you've since I've met you and since I've known you you've always just had a great way with being around kids what what really put you on to like you knew you want to be like a uh, person that worked with kids Um, I I can't really pinpoint a moment. I just know I always was gravitated towards playing with children at like parties and at family events and with cousins and stuff. I think there's just a level of playfulness and innocence that children possess that we lose when we're older and They just make them a lot more enjoyable to be around and a lot more fun to be around than adults because adults can be kind of lame and standoffish and not very fun. Um, But for as long as I can remember, I mean, my mom always loves to tell the story of when we used to, well, stories of when we used to go to playgrounds when I was about four or five. And I'd always go to the sandbox and try to pick up the one and two year olds, like (laughs) any child that was smaller than me. I was just always interested in 
kind of be the person of fun for them and then like getting the reciprocation of fun from them. Um, then I started babysitting at 11 and then working at summer camps, working at schools, working at centers. And it's just kind of been what I've always done and what I've always loved. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting here because when I watched this movie the first time, um, because I watched it by myself the first time. I don't remember why, but anyways, I watched this movie because we usually watch most of our movies together. But yeah. I watched this movie the first time and the character that Lupita plays, um, uh, Miss Caroline, reminded me so much of you. Of, oh. of the characters that remind me of you in like, let's go through all my history of film. It's this character and um, Miss Honey, which I always tell you, Miss Honey from um, Matilda. I that makes like, me feel like you see a very positive side of me. I do. Well, I do. <laughs> like even prior to us having kids, I was just felt like you had this sort of energy. And I thought that Lupita's character, that's why I really wanted to do this movie um, for the 10th mm-hmm. episode too, for the big special 10th episode. Woo woo! <laughs> I wanted to do this movie with you because it was really a character that I thought um, just had your same sort of uh, reaction to, I think you'd have the same sort of reaction in this, in the situation with dealing with uh, zombies and having to get the kids to safety. Mm -hmm. I totally felt like a very, yeah, very close relationship to her too. I saw a lot of myself in her, not necessarily a hundred percent of the way that she dealt with the kids, but a lot of the way that she dealt with the adults, how she kind of had like a split personality is kind of the way I view myself where it's like, and you know this, the kids get a hundred percent of good, happy, positive, fun me. And then by the time I interact with an adult, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm spent. I have no patience for you. I have like zero patience for any of your bullshit. Um, Cause I keep that a hundred percent for the children who I think deserve it so much more than adults do, which I don't think is a hundred percent fair but it's just the way it is. So I kind of felt the same way with her when she was with, um, what's his name? What is it? Mr. Kitty Winkle? Is that what his name is? Oh, uh, yeah. Teddy McGiggle. Yeah. Teddy McGiggle. So I totally understood with her where she's like, okay, kids. Ha ha ha. And then would turn around and had like that broken toy from the gift shop in his rib cage. <laughs> it was like threatening him, so but good. then just like kept turning around with a smile to the kids being like, we're just playing a game and he just needs a little cuddle to make him feel better. It was like totally exactly how I feel like I interact with children versus adults. It's like, kids get the best part and then adults kind of get yeah I get my shortness <laughs> I feel like Ava and our, our nephew Ollie who's also part of daycare I feel like they're gonna have a very different childhood memory than I'm going to of their yeah, absolutely absolutely <laughs> absolutely mom was and so sweet like, oh yeah uh, yeah yeah sure yes. okay yeah all the time <laughs> for sure for sure that like and that made me laugh a lot and even just the way like because with kids and you can see that so much in the movie is that like um kids pick up so much more on like your tone your body language your facial expressions than they do on what's actually being said and what's actually going on in their surroundings and like that's what made that movie so powerful was like realizing that like kids are going to go through trauma and kids are going to go through big life events. And I think so much of their memory of that moment depends on the adults in the situation and how they decide to handle it and how they decide to portray their emotions to the children. Right. And like, that was what's so interesting with the parents, how they were like, Oh my God, our kids so traumatized. Like they must be so overwhelmed with the situation. And the military were like, um, actually, no, because the, the adults decided to reframe the memory in such a, I mean, the event, which would then turn into a memory into such a positive thing. So I think, yeah, I think, and you and I both do that too, like how much you and I fake argue and like laugh and we joke and we make fun of each other. And Ava gets so involved in it because she thinks it's funny and it's loud and we're joking and we're smiling even if you and I are like actually taking little digs at each other. <laughs> so I think like that, that's why I love this movie was it was such a great representation of that, of you can portray through your body language that everything's okay. Kids will believe it's okay. And I think that's cool. Yeah. yeah. What I, what I 
kind of had down his note here is uh, kind of like a summarized version of that is that I feel like the kids in this movie, they they would pick up their sponges in some areas and then just mm-hmm. everything else go over their head, right? Like every yeah. time someone said a bad word, they were like, bad word, yeah. sing that yeah. kind of giggle song. But like zombies were around them and they were like, oh, yeah, this is a game. Like they wouldn't catch yeah. like the, the rotting flesh or like even the, the smell would have been terrible. That's oh, nice. absolutely. That absolutely. And even like when the teacher came in and she was covered in blood and guts yeah. and she decided to be like, I got in a jam fight, but don't eat it. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and like the kids were like, ah, ha, ha, right? Because I think, like, and that's what I was talking about before about like how innocent and like naive children are makes that um, something that's a possibility, right? It, it opens up the possibility for parents to take any situation and just reframe it in the way that they choose to. And that goes both ways, right? Like you and I have talked about parents who take minor life experiences and explode them into something a lot more dramatic and a lot more emotionally taxing Mm -hmm. and children pick up on that just as much right so you really have to decide and pick and choose and be very aware of how you're deciding to frame a situation to a child because that they're looking 100% to you as the beacon of how am I supposed to feel in this situation so, so. In, in this situation, did, was there any moment that, was there anything that Lupita did that you're just like, oh, I would have done that differently? Or, or for the most part, were you like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I, that's how I would have handled that. Because there was a lot of it was like slapstick, sort of impossible. Yeah. But like, do you feel like there was a lot of it that you're like, oh, I would have handled it like that? Because I feel like Lupita, I'm sorry to interject my answer here, but I felt like Lupita as a character was such a perfect horror character. Like mm-hmm. she didn't do anything stupid where I'm like, oh, you idiot. She actually just like nailed it. But I think that that had to go against the guy who was doing stuff, stuff dumb the whole time. So I think so. I think not so much Lupita's character. It's a movie and I'm really well aware of that. I think the flaw of the entire situation was um, kind of kind of like the idea that all children would play along with her games. Mm. Um, and that all children were coming from the same place. Like I said, like when you have an entire group of children and you have children that are all raised by different parents who've gone through all different types of life experiences and you have, I don't know how many there were, like 15, 15 kids in this. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, like you have 15 different reactions Mm. and you and I talk about this all the time, like even just between Ava, our daughter, and Ollie, our nephew, their reactions to different situations are so extremely different. Even though overall their life experiences have been quite similar, they both come here every day. They're both in the same daycare. Like me and my sister are quite similar in our parenting styles, but biologically they both have such different personalities that their reactions to situations are so different. And I think that they somewhat touched on that in the movie, but for example, like I keep going back to the scene where she's trying to get them to get all into the gift shop from the tractor mm-hmm. and she's singing the old McDonald's song. Is that what she was singing at that point? I, I can't remember so. what song. Anyway, she was singing a song and she's playing her ukulele and she's got them all holding on to each other's shoulders. And I think in a situation like that, you would have like three kids crying because even though it was a game, <laughs> zombies are horrifying yeah right like there's reasons why even in movies like and we saw this with Ava I mean Ava's a lot younger but when we watched Moana she was like not this today at like a darker scene right and like that it was a movie it was on a screen she was fully protected so I think like in a situation like that I didn't find that a flaw of Lupita's character I found it more a flaw of like lumping all the kids together to kind of having the same personalities ish i mean you did have that one kid with the putt putt golf max he's my I th- max i was just gonna highlight him he was the he's one so bad kid. i yeah. i loved him i thought he was so funny i think that like uh, i'm such a I, I guess i'm a trash person i thought that him bullying um felix i think it's the other kid's name yeah uh was so funny i thought the bullying oh, in this so movie funny. was just so it felt like a 90s movie like the jokes they're making and the things they yeah. can say to kids i was like I couldn't believe it. I was like, Jesus, you can't like say the R word like that. Like, 
Yeah, but Max, oh, it thought, was so funny. To your point, I thought that Max was like the one bad kid, realistically. Yeah, and he still like followed all the rules and like, you know what I mean? So I feel like that was kind of where it was a little bit. He had one like, meltdown. He's a dream yeah. kid. He yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> like he had one meltdown at like the next day when they hadn't eaten. Like, yeah, he's a dream kid because he went to well, go golf. And that brings up like a really good point about like the not eating, right? Like kids experience hangriness and think about where they slept, right? Like they slept on the floor in a souvenir shop and they were like away from their home and they're only five. Like they are young children. One kid was scared too. It was uh, um, Beth, the little girl that had a crush on Felix. I have the names in front of me. I'm not like photographically remembering this or anything like that. I was really impressed. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh God, I don't remember anybody's names no, at no. all. <laughs> so uh, Beth was the one that had a crush on Felix. And she was like the one, I feel like you had to like rope the kids, like for sake of story, you had to rope the kids into like certain personalities. So like the one yeah. bad kid represented like five bad kids, realistically. The one yes. empathetic little girl represented like all of the little girls in the class pr- pretty much. And then Felix represented the little weird kid that I loved so much because he's yeah. the cutest kid of all time. He was so cute. But I, and I think like, speaking on Beth, right? Like she, they kind of highlighted that she was too afraid to go to sleep because Mm -hmm. her mom sings her a poem. So in a situation like that, like, let's say that Beth is the empathetic, sensitive kid in that situation. She would have been freaking out over the zombies, right? Like to be like, oh, she was fine with zombies. She was fine. Like, cause their faces were torn off and like their entire mouths were exposed and you could like see their jaw bones and like limbs were missing. They were eating sheep. The smell, you know? the, smell. <laughs> the smell, the smell would be so bad. Like everywhere. That, yeah. So I feel like somebody like little Beth would be overwhelmed through the whole experience like it wouldn't just be like oh now she's having a hard time to sleep <laughs> so I think that's kind of where it was a little bit more flawed but you had to you had to flaw it in some way in order to make the storyline go yes. the way in which they wanted it to go so I have a question which one do you think Ava is more like Max Beth or Felix 100% Max 100%, 100% a mix of Max and Felix with zero Beth our daughter oh, is like, yeah. yes, we, we love her. We love her. You know, she's not going to listen to this podcast. Maybe she will when she's older. But um, <laughs> yeah, she has all of that aggression of that Max kid and then all of the weirdness of that Felix kid who Absolutely. went so in character of dressing up as Darth Vader that he was convinced he was safe. That was so cute. That was probably one of my favorite scenes. Loved I it. love that. And then how the gate closed and he like really believed that he was the one who made the gate close. I thought I, I loved that scene. I thought that was such a. So it's like a chef's kiss moment. That was so absolutely. perfect. The, yeah. the gate close. Yeah, I agree with you. The gate closing was so good. Like with his like force. But I, I thought that part was yeah. just like so adorable. And yeah, yeah. I really love that. Such a good callback and such a good like that to me was also such a good representation of. um kind of like the double-edged sword of how you react in a situation, right? Like, so mm-hmm. if Miss Caroline had made the whole situation very serious, I was like, listen, we are in a, in a state of danger. These things can kill you. Felix would have never left. Right. But the fact that she framed it in like, it's just a game, you're fine, made him feel like he was invincible and he could play his part in the game. Yeah. So I think like that's a really interesting way to view the whole thing as well as like the how you decide to protect a child's emotional well-being may impact their physical well-being because they aren't actually fully aware of the gravity of situations right? yes and I felt like just to inside baseball this because I feel like a lot of our families can probably listen to this podcast because we're both on it as opposed to just me talking um <laughs> I feel like that Felix uh him trying to save his uncle there reminded me so much of my nephew Ollie, who I think is the sweetest kid on the planet, would go to that length and know Absolutely. that much about tractors to yes. be able to save me. It was like so much about like our nephew that like, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that can relate with a kid that's yeah. like that little boy, a little boy that's just yeah. that adorable, that rule bound, and just wants yeah. to help and is just so committed. I thought that he reminded me so much of Ollie that I could probably cry because oh, absolutely, that absolutely, kid, great, great casting for that that kid. I thought he was phenomenal. Uh, speaking yeah. of dressing up and committing to roles, 
from my understanding, you used to do performances with your sister and hand out tickets to have people attend those, your parents to attend those performances. So imagination is a big part of your childhood, right? <laughs> what a twist. What? I was not prepared for this, um, this transition. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. We and my sister, we lived up in a compound in the Middle East. There were four houses. Our next door neighbor, Lucy, um, she was the same age as my sister. My sister and I are only a year and a half apart. So we were super close growing up. Also hate each other a lot growing up, but overall super close. Um, so there was my sister and Lucy were the same age. I was a year and a half younger. And then the third house um, had a little girl called Holly. She was about two years younger than me. Um, so usually Kaylee, Lucy, and I, because we were a bit older, but then sometimes Holly would join us. We would um, learn dances. And by learn, this is pre-YouTube, this is pre-anything, learn from each other and develop choreographed um, dances to Spice Girls, Backstreet Boys, Hanson. Um, what was the other one? Uh, bewitched was that what they were called? Bewitched. bewitched. Oh my god! I can't, oh, like, is it bewitched? Charmed. Oh my god! I can't even remember. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look them up now because now they're in my head. As, well, when you as, find them, I will. I will put them in the show notes. But yeah. Continue. Okay. Um. Yeah, all sorts of bands in sync. Um. Anyways, we would come up with all these dances, and then we would make our own pamphlets like little um what are they called when you have a, like the whole show order of what songs were going to come next and oh my god have, you went that hard oh we went so hard we would like decorate the front of them and of course this was like pre-photocopy so every single person in our family would get their own individual <laughs> show routine and we would get dressed up we would set up the whole rooms we had it all down to a tea. We even had intermissions. We would make drinks. We would make, oh, we went all out. And when I mean we did this, like, this was every week to two weeks. Like, we went out. <laughs> this is how we spent our time, right? Like, you know, shows were on TV for a certain amount of time, and then they weren't on TV anymore. So we had to find ways to pass the time. So this is how we passed our time. And then we would dance and our parents were such good supportive people that they really made us feel like we could do this professionally if we wanted to. Who said you couldn't? I think you may have Oof. been able to. I mean, I think I gave up on a dream too early and you're just kind of rekindling that flame if you ask me. What I'm is saying crazy. is, if you and your sister put the dedication that you've both put into your own careers right now, into these chore choreographed dances who knows where you'd be right now i don't know who knows i don't know i don't i don't think very far to be 100 percent <laughs> honest and that's that's not berating myself it's it is berating myself we we weren't good dancers you know we really none of us really had rhythm um neither does britney spears no offense britney spears if you're listening to this neither does britney spears but britney spears was a very lucky individual in the sense of she came right at about the right time like if Britney Spears was trying to get famous right now she would never make it like she was kind of in this like time warp moment where it was like oh we'll just take anyone as long as you're you know completely fabricated by your production team and we just kind of don't stand for that anymore people have standards what so. you're saying is that Britney Spears was she was lucky she was a yeah. star she <laughs> cries 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 in her lonely heart is what, is that what you're saying I'm just saying she knew it she knew it she's she's as aware as we are yeah uh question now because you mentioned a band uh through there that really does connect with this movie uh Hanson Lupita's yeah. character followed Hanson would you mm -hmm. have been the same way would that have been something that would have happened to you would you have went to Australia maybe broken your arm following Hanson then been stuck there teaching this you could have been you could have been Lupita, Lupita's character I mean, I definitely could have been. The way in which Lapita and I differ is that I was never a Taylor girl. I was definitely a Zach girl. My sister, because she was older and more mature than me, was definitely a Taylor 
girl, but I was a Zach girl because he was younger, the drummer, you know, I hope his name is Zach and I'm not completely embarrassing myself. But What's the other, sure there's Zach. three of them, right? From Hanson. I'm hoping that there's some people that grew up in the nineties that know who Hanson is. I will put it into the show notes. Mm, Bob is going into the show notes, whether you like it or not. So, I mean, I think it has to at this point, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think, I think maybe you even need to like have it in the theme music. I mean, something like that, but now I, it's really starting to bother me because I'm trying to remember Isaac. Isaac was the oldest one. Poor Isaac. I, I want to know if people are listening to this. Can you please comment if you were an Isaac girl? Because I feel like there are zeros. And I'd be really happy to know that. Were you an Isaac girl? Is that, is that the one you liked? No, no, no. Isaac was the old one. Oh, right. Okay. Probably like two years older. But when you're younger, you're like, you're ancient. You know, you're so old. Isaac you was can 17. drive a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was a 17 year old child no oh, absolutely but he looked so ancient when we were yeah kids. but that's always like, oh, the case God. though like what happens to like the we're going off the rails here we're, we're don't worry about this thing we'll make it back i i got some things here though that's like the jonas brothers right like the oldest jonas brother i don't remember which one that was now did no. he do well i don't know much about this I'm talking on my ass now i i i was jonas jonas brothers were way far past yeah, jonas time. brothers were the newer version of hansen yeah, and I just don't think I followed them enough. I, I mean, except for Nick, Nick Jonas. Jonas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I think for so many different no, reasons, like no, no, he was Joe the Jonas. main guy. Oh, well, I guess you're right. Oh, yeah, because he's the one that's with What's Her Face, right? Who? Um, what's her name? Joel? Put this the girl in the show from notes. Game of Thrones. Girl from Game of Thrones. Khaleesi. No. No. <laughs> no. Brianna Tarth. No. <laughs> no. The older sister. Yes. Um, uh, I, I wish I, I'll put her name in the show notes because I can't remember right now, but Sansa. I was messing around. Sansa. That's right. That's right. Gwendolyn okay. Christie is Brianna Tarth, and I think is maybe my favorite person that's in that show. That's off topic, but yeah. I, I really like Gwendolyn Christie. So yeah. Yeah. I um I I know you do. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what else yeah. to say. I, I know you do. <laughs> Gwendolyn Christie, she's amazing. She's amazing. I would follow her career anywhere it goes. I may do the movie in fabric and have you back on the show for that episode. But yeah, well, is that your way of making me watch it? It's a phenomenal <laughs> movie. It's a, anyone listening, uh, 2008 in fabric is also a phenomenal movie, and I could not recommend that movie more. It's a weird horror comedy. I will definitely do an episode on that sooner or later because I love that movie. And you will watch it with me one time. I know. And you know what? I have to say that at this exact moment in time, and you're going to feel so um, elated by this comment, but at this exact moment in time, I wish I had watched it so that I would have a lot more to say about it, but I haven't watched it. So. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Don't worry about that. That's okay. You will have me back and uh, we'll watch it. I just can't commit. Isn't it like three hours? It's not. It's an hour and a half tops, but like, it's okay. We'll get to that later. (laughs) Uh, okay now I have here, <laughs> here's I have a two-part question because this is like I think my overall um actually let's start with this part question who's your favorite character overall in the movie we're counting kids we're counting everyone who's your favorite character okay uh no, I've forgotten his name again just say which character is and I'll tell you his name the um the the kid um Teddy McGiggle. <laughs> Teddy the giggle yeah it's like oh my god I can't even describe who he is I'm having such a hard yeah, time Josh Gad's okay. character yeah, Teddy McGiggle has got to be the best character in the entire movie by far. Josh um, Gad's best role, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, I, I think that like he should play that scumbag all the time because I thought the flip of him being that's another person that did a good flip, I think, because you yes. said Lupita did the same thing. I thought his flip of how he interacted with kids to how he was in real life was like so good the fact that we don't give more oscars for comedy like i don't care what anyone says i think we need to give more oscars for comedy because josh gad's role in this was so underrated and so goddamn funny like everything about it and from start to finish too absolutely and i think what made his character so hilarious and so entertaining to watch as well was i think deep down everybody knows slash firmly believes that every child tv star is like that that's my second part of this question 
If you yeah. were stuck in the zombie situation, let's just say you're Miss Caroline in the zombie situation. Who mm-hmm. is your Teddy McGiggle character? Who's your child entertainer? You can go past to present. Who's your child entertainer uh, that you think would be the most likeless if you were put in this situation? Who do you think would be most like this? Captain Feathersword from the Wiggles. <laughs> so specific. <laughs> Well, you know, I had him right on the tip of my tongue because before you asked the question, I was like, you know who he reminds me of is Captain Feathersword for the Wiggles. Captain Feathersword, I mean, I think what that's a niche an unfair episode. thing. Go on. I think, that's, I think that's an unfair thing to say because I think Captain Feathersword is actually a whole lot more playful and fun. Oh, yeah, I adult. think he's probably a nice guy. But I think it comes across as like, he probably does coke. He probably <laughs> like definitely gets prostitutes everywhere they go Jesus. like I just think he's such a partier like yeah. he's the type of guy that like is showing up to set so hungover yeah and he's just like doing a rail of coke to just like get through the episode <laughs> just like slander. that's just <laughs> sorry Captain Feathersword but I also don't think he'd be offended I think he'd be like I don't know if she gets it yeah so I don't coke. feel bad about doing that I think he he's a partier and he likes to party and there's nothing shameful about that no no we're um, not shaming you at all because I think we're that not shaming you. I think he'd be yeah I, I really if anyone's a parent that's listening to this because I know a handful of people will be yeah Captain Feathersword um or maybe maybe I don't know maybe a hundred thousand people listen to this are parents with <laughs> the, or or know of this or maybe if you're not parents you still just know of this character yeah. um either way I'll put him in the show notes but <laughs> Captain Feathersword is one of the funniest parts of the show, The Wiggles. Absolutely. And The Wiggles are just, yeah, that's, that's, okay, who's your favorite Wiggle now? We're going to get into this. Why not? Who's your favorite Wiggle? <sighs> well, I think that that's a very difficult question to answer because I think you need to tell me situationally. Like, who's my what? favorite overall Wiggle on behalf of, like, what a who do I think is the best person out of the Wiggles? Oh, no, definitely. Performer. What is it? Person. Oh, performer. What is so that's what I mean by my situation. Person. Wait, why would like I... I think Emma is the best thing that happened to the Wiggles, but she's not my favorite Wiggle. She's but she's Ava's favorite Wiggle. I think she's like an amazing dancer. I think she's super cool. How she's finally the she's... only woman that's on the Wiggle. <laughs> Shout out to Emma. She's the most popular Wiggle by like a landslide. Too. Oh, absolutely. It's not close absolutely but i think performer definitely locky locky goes hard in the paint and i just think he like i just look forward to every time he's going to be the one that's singing and it'll be like the other ones are like no 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 and then locky will come he's like it just completely gives it and he's the best singer he i don't know overall he's my favorite let's just go on the record for a couple of things here number one Hearing you just sing there, you never should have quit. I think you just can <laughs> that. You should never should have quit. Number, Thank you so much. I'm number two, for I feel bills. like a lot, a lot of people listening to this, um, yeah, this is what you have to look forward to. If you don't have kids yet, this is what you have to look forward to is very introspective looks at the Wiggles, a child entertainer group that if they came to Victoria, I would I would definitely have to, we'd have to go. Oh, we'd absolutely have, we'd have to, to go. go. Yeah, absolutely. I don't care how much it costs. But back to That's your- okay. Yeah, absolutely. To back to your original point, Captain Feather Sword. Um, okay, that's that's modern. Who would you say uh, old school? Because I know you watch child, and this is for the, the um, '90s kids. Like, who would you say old school? A favorite childhood performer, old school. Is that no, 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 ask? no, no. The childhood performer that you think would uh, be the most like Teddy McGiggle. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think this has to do a lot more with um, alcohol use than actual <laughs> like split personality. Uh, but I've heard Mr. Raffi is uh, <laughs> quite, quite the party animal um, and is quite the angry drunk, which I think is like a very interesting, um, I mean, look at that because Raffi is like the sweetest kind of soft spoken um you know, acoustic guitar singing childhood um, performer. Here's so to hear that he's like an angry drunk is, I think that that switch for me, because I only found out that Rafi was an angry drunk 
like five or six years ago. So I spent my entire childhood, teen years, early adulthood thinking he was kind of like this forest loving BC hippie who just plays his guitar and is so sweet and kind and whatever. So to find out at that stage was to me like the same as watching the character in the movie go from being so sweet to being crazy. (laughs) Here's what I will say about Rafi, and I've also, we live in the same house. We spend all the time in the world together. So I've also heard the same things. Here's what I will say about Rafi, and here's what I'll say about Rafi in this situation. I think he'd be angry maybe at the adults, never at the kids. I think he'd have survival skills. And that's why I think Rafi would be my choice to be at this point. So I feel like he'd get me out of the situation. Like, I feel like Rafi is, like, I feel like other childhood entertainers may not get me out of the situation. But Rafi is such like a socialist and such like a pe- man of the people that I'm like, yeah, he might get drunk and angry, but I think he'd try to get us out of the situation. Yes, but also we watched that character drink alcohol and like I don't think he's wasted. Not, but, but who knows, right? I we don't not. know in a situation like that. Like that's a very stressful situation. Like, is that how Rafi would cope with his um his kind of like fear and anxiety about the whole situation. Like, would he be the guy who was drinking hand sanitizer straight from the from the bottle? We don't know. He we might do know. that and then just like mow down a thousand zombies because he's such a mm. goddamn hero. He is a hero. <laughs> if he's he is such a hero, hero you would actually he is a hero. maybe he'd drink drunk and then just mow down a thousand zombies, save oh, Lupita, absolutely. save that other guy while busting out the best songs on the guitar. Doing modern oh, so version. True. What's the baby beluga? Do a modern oh. version of baby beluga. That, that one made yeah. me cry. Yeah, oh, that was beautiful. He'd kill it. That was so beautiful. Shout it. out if you know baby beluga. And uh, I'm going to cry just talking about it. And you want to cry. Rafi, um, we went to go and see him before Ava was born. I went with my nephew and my sister and my mom. And we went to go see Rafi. And he sung um like an adult version of baby beluga and it was called like I think it's like millennial beluga or something oh it's so beautiful it's like for all the people who between like 1986 to 1996 who grew up with him and um and like Bali thinking about it he it's like all of us are now parents so we're the ones who are bringing our kids to see Rafi so he like wrote a song for us about like social change and um climate change and how we're kind of the people who are standing up and trying to make a difference in the world and how he like supports that and hopes we like continue to do that anyway check it out on youtube it'll, if it'll you want to have a good cry yes please do because it's oh it's you can't convince me a man that wrote that song would save the kids <laughs> so by like it's who knows true. what he but, used the alcohol for multiple cocktails oh, off absolutely. there rafi's a hero i think of all he the childhood hero. entertainers short of mr rogers who i believe <sighs> fought in the war because i think Did? mr yeah mr rogers would actually would have been out of there. He oh God! Just been like take it. He would have taken his shoes off, put on oh. some combat boots, yeah, and actually just been out of there. But he Absolutely. would have felt bad about killing the zombies. That's the thing with Mister Rogers. Oh yeah, he wouldn't have killed them. He, he wouldn't, wouldn't have, have killed them. He no. wouldn't have. Those are still his neighbors, oh. and he's. Oh, I think he would have tried to talk them down and somehow made it work. You know, oh. like I kind of feel like he'd be able to like reach some chord in them and talk to the human that was still left inside them. They were still clapping and listening to music. So I think Mr. Oh, Rogers yeah. would have been like a familiar face to them and saved the day. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He is, he he's the type of person that if somebody told me something negative about him, like apparently he was, this is negative. Hear. No, no, it's not, <laughs> it's Sorry, not negative. Much. Apparently he was like a very challenging parent to have because he was so earnest and so good that apparently it kind of made it so that his kids wanted to rebel a lot more because they were kind of like, ugh. It's like being around a saint at all times who like everything was reframed in such a positive way. And he was always trying to like open the floor for dialogue. You know, like, I think that would be really hard when you're 13, 14 to Mm -hmm. 16 to try to deal with your dad. And every time you're angry, he's like, oh, take a deep breath and let's think about it from the other person's perspective. When sometimes you just want your dad to be like, punch him in the face, you know, kind of like meet you at your level, I feel like would be hard. For but the record, love... neither of our dads would have said that, but go on. No, God, no, not at all. <laughs> no, but I think my dad would not would have, a little he more than did, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. He did validate my anger. Yeah. 
a lot more. Like he was a, it was never like, see it from the other person's perspective. He would eventually get me there. Mm -hmm. But in the heat of the moment, he'd be like, wow, that woman is a bitch. Like, I can't believe she did that. That's so messed up. Like that's blah, 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 blah. And then as I started to come down, he would then guide me to like, well, maybe from her perspective and help me see it like that. But I think if he tried to meet me at the place of seeing it from that person's perspective originally, that would annoy me. <laughs> yeah. Let me just be angry yeah. for like 10 minutes because I can see it from her perspective already, but I'm, I'm annoyed, you know? So I feel like Mr. Rogers would be a great person for a friend's dad for me. Yes. Like, I think my personality is not a good match. I think that he'd be a great friend's dad. I'd be like, oh, shit, I'm going to go over to, I don't know Fred Rogers' kids' names. I'm going to go over to whatever. I, th- I think it would be Connor's dad. If, it, yeah. if you're going to, if you were going to link one of our friends. We're going a little too niche, our friend Connor. <laughs> <laughs> our friend Connor, he seems like his dad would be, he seems like he'd be related to I've met the Rogers, Connor. I just have to say. For the record, because I know my friend Connor's going to listen to this, I, I've met Connor's dad before. Very, very much one of the nicest men I've ever met. It's not shocking that his children yeah. are all perfect little angels, but like not not just like perfect little angels, like they're um, compassionate. Yeah, very yeah compassionate they're com- very compassionate, people. but they're just very interesting, interesting people. I feel like everyone growing up, you uh, throughout your life, you'll meet a person like my friend Connor, who's an incredibly hardworking, very earnest person. Who uh, I recently got to see um, him with his with his daughter. For the first time because of COVID, right? So we recently got to meet his kid for the first time. And to see him around his kid was absolutely um, beautiful. And I feel like you all grow up and you you meet a person, like you you get a friend that's like a Connor. And um, all I can say is if you, if you do meet a person that's just very earnest, very hardworking, that always wants the best for you. If you have that person, your friend, um, hold on to them and just, that's my advice. That's yeah. my advice on that topic. Because I think I, if you're listening to this and we say, Think of a friend who you wouldn't be shocked was raised by Mr. Rogers. Mm. <laughs> that should be your person you never let go yes. ever because that is a gem just in the way Mr. Rogers is a gem, just in the way we're talking about him as if he was a flawless saint because he was a flawless saint. I think knowing a person like him is uh, that's a very rare and very incredible thing to have. To take it back to to the movie here, I feel that um, it feels like Lupita's character, Miss Caroline, kind of seemed like she was raised by Mr. Rogers. Like she had that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes and no, because I think um, going back to it, like to see how she responded to the adults, like even how she had to lie about still being engaged because. Oh yeah, Rogers was so creepy and stuff like that. I think. But I think, interestingly enough, if you want to get political, I always and, do. Um, <laughs> I it, always do. I think Mr. Rogers was the way Mr. Rogers was a hundred percent because he was a white male. Mm. I on. think if Mr. Rogers grew up because she was she was she was American, right? And then she went to Australia was what they were alluding to. Or was she British and went to, they never said where she was from. I'm trying to like figure no. out where her accent was from. You know what? But she wasn't from. Australia. She ended up there. Yeah, they she ended up they there. They specify. Anyways, regardless, if she was raised in the Western world in any place, odds are being a woman of color, mm-hmm. her life experience would have been a whole lot more challenging. Mm-hmm than Mr. Rogers' life would have been from a very general political level. I'm not saying that Mr. Rogers didn't go through his own personal struggles in any sort of way. I'm just saying overall. So I wonder if Mr. Rogers were a woman of color, whether he would be a lot more like Lupita's character. The thing is about Mr. Rogers too, on that exact same token, is that he was such a such an ally that like I feel like he wouldn't have gotten the voice to say a lot of the things he said back yeah. then oh absolutely and the allyship and the things he wanted to try and yeah. the amount of things he did um because he's such an ally like peak allyship oh, like, for everybody for, for everybody, everybody for yeah. human beings right like he, yeah the, the thing is the, the problem with the world is that we have guys like Fred Rogers not running for president <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean yeah. that's who should like you should have read but like um because he's such an allyship um yeah human beings in general 
but in such a beautiful non-assertive way Mm -hmm. like it was like he's really you know how people annoyingly and problematically slash racist say I don't see color I truly believe that Mr. Rogers is a person who didn't see anything. Yeah. He like didn't see different abilities. He didn't see race. He did in the most will love you like my neighbor, no matter what yeah. kind of way. Not like I don't see your differences because your differences is what makes you beautiful. He would see your differences for what makes you beautiful. But in the way of like, I, I, he actually loved everybody. Yes, he really did. Right? He really did. Um, one thing I will say about this movie again, and this happens in almost every movie I watch with my wife. She does this very interesting thing where she cries for teamwork. <laughs> can, you my, can you hear my voice cracking? She's crying right you. now. That's why I just want everyone to know that if you're listening to this, she's, she's crying right now because we're talking about teamwork. I know yeah. I'm not in the same room <laughs> as her, but I know she's crying because she, Thanks. any yeah. of these talks. So at the end of this movie, because everyone <laughs> teamed together. Oh, let's add to this. At the end of this movie where everyone teamed together and um, uh, it all worked out and they're in the room, they're singing Taylor Swift. My wife was crying. <laughs> Here's something that'll make you cry even a little more, by the way, Jenny. Uh, I'm crying because you brought up that scene again. But anyway, Here's yeah. something that'll make you cry even more. <laughs> so as we're all aware of the song, if you've seen the movie, by the way, it's on Amazon. I, uh, Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes as well. This movie is on Amazon, so you can watch it anytime if you have Amazon. Um there's a, there's a song in this movie that's played throughout. Do you know the song, Jenny? Yeah. Shake it Shake off. Shake it off. Yeah. Shake it off. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, that song almost wasn't in this movie. Really? What happened was the record label was like, no, you can't have the song in the movie. You're some indie Australian film that's about zombies. Oh. I don't know if that's a detail of what they said, but they said, you can't have this song in the movie. Yeah. So and it was such a pivotal part of the script that Lupita called Taylor Swift and said, hey, can we have the song in the movie? It's really pivotal. It's a movie. And Taylor Swift's like, yeah, sure. And signed over the rights to be in the movie. That wow. Team, yeah, what That's a flex. That's really cute. What a flex, right? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. really cute. Oh, I like that. That's I really cute. like that. I like I liked finding that fact out. And also, yeah. it just added credence to the fact that Lupita is phenomenal. Oh, she's incredible. Yeah, she's she incredible. Did, she did not have to do this movie. No, she didn't. But you could tell she had so much fun doing it. Can we just start, can this be the petition to, I might even name the episode, so this, petition to have Lupita do more comedy? Oh my God. I, no, I'm sorry. I can't sign that. I just want her to be in more stuff. Everything, overall, right? Overall, overall. Oh. She's, she's an incredible actress. So good. Incredible. I love everything she's in. She's a once I in a generation actress, phenomenal. I think. I, oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, she was phenomenal. I, and I thought it was really fun to see her in this because, of course, she's she's well known for a much more serious role. Yes. Um, that I think it was really interesting to see her in, in in a very interesting role because it actually was serious. Yes. You know, the the overall impression of the movie was comedy, but not from her character. No, right, she had to play it deadly movie. serious. That's what I actually yeah. really liked. She was of all the she characters was the in the most movie. Serious. Yeah, she was. Yeah. It's like she, her and um Felix's mom. I think yes. that her and Felix's I love Felix's yeah. mom too. That's another too. character I would yeah. love to see more of. I feel like yeah. both those characters <laughs> had to play everything like they played a deadpan, like they were in a Absolutely. goddamn serious movie. And yeah. then um uh Dave, the brother, he he was just all over the map. And I usually don't like that sort of um that sort of like idiot bro character like i just don't really find that that an interesting character to watch he played it so well like i think that the scene of him walking i I mentioned this to you earlier him walking felix to school and felix getting bullied by all the kids actually is one of the funnier scenes i've ever seen absolutely That, that killed me that actually killed me yeah i have to say personally like the mark of a good movie but especially the mark of a really good comedy for me is when you can take each part of a movie and realize that you would be satisfied if they just stayed with that plot so for me like just the beginning part of the movie before zombies were even introduced just the brother like the uncle Mm -hmm. and felix just their relationship and just how 
blatantly inappropriate and self-absorbed the uncle was was enough to carry the whole film like I would have probably watched an entire film of that interaction going on and on and on and on because it was just so incredibly comical it didn't need zombies at all right like no not at all and then I felt the same of Teddy and Giggle as well like I found that if they just focused on an entire movie on like his multiple personalities yeah would have been incredibly entertaining and that to me like we made them and then if they just obviously focused just on the zombies and just focused on Miss Caroline and her way of of distracting the children and just Miss Caroline being a teacher right oh absolutely I I would watch that just Miss Caroline being a teacher with Max in the class yes that the little little bully kid just watching watching her have to have a class with that kid picking on Felix I'd watch that for multiple season tv series I think that'd be for sure and that that to me was like that's why I love movies is that I, I or I love when it's a good movie is that when you realize that each scene could easily carry an entire movie and then you put them all together and you're like oh how fantastic is this that there's just multiple amazing storylines that are then all meshed together into one movie it makes it fantastic I think you briefly said it but just even just the I think you did say this though but even just the zombies just like just the American team because I think the Americans were really funny in this they were just their reaction to everything and they were so American about it right like um yeah. now is it fast zombies or slow zombies it's like oh it's slow oh okay it's not a big deal I'm like it's still zombies man absolutely <laughs> absolutely and I think like that's what I think I'm, I'm such an easy sell for that when when the American military is made fun of in such an accurate way by other countries yes because most movies are made and created out of the United States right. where the military is the forefront of everything perfect and angelic and soldiers are heroes and the American military is what's saving the world and democracy and it it's so overplayed and personally Propaganda. not yeah and personally not something I all agree with so mm-hmm. when I see other countries mocking the American military and I feel like this movie did it in such a delicate way that it almost seemed like it was just part of the overall feel of the movie instead of it being a dig yes um made it so um classy in the way that it was funny like it was just like ha 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 get it but then not like we're gonna keep on drilling it like it was just like kind of an offhand like everybody's stupid in this movie including (laughs) well they did a good job of it because they also at the same time made the americans like the heroes in a way that america would be the hero do you know what i mean they messed up and they kind of saved the day but they were about the bomb kids because they yeah exactly nothing from (laughs) nothing from their tactical standpoint they messed up they were about to bomb some children yeah yeah but But they were also the the reason why it happened in the first place the whole thing leaked from their camp but then they end up being the heroes because they just had enough guns to shoot them down right which is like so american (laughs) so 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 american and if anyone that's americans listening to us i think you'll get the you'll be in on this too i can't see why you wouldn't be it's no yeah it's very much an american reaction to it i thought i thought they yeah i agree with you i think they really really nailed that part of it yeah, definitely. And I thought that was, that it was just such an added touch that didn't necessarily have to be there. And like I said, it was so delicate and so classy that it was not very many scenes that actually that the American um, military no. were involved in the movie at all. Um, and I think, yeah, if you're American, and if you support the, Amer- the American military, then you'll actually be quite pleased with the movie because they were the ones who saved the day in the end anyway. So yeah, that even though they were made fun of, they still saved the day. So <laughs> like I said too, I, it felt like some of the jokes that that, that they made in this, um, especially towards kids, I, I thought that it was one of those films. I'm like, oh man, because uh, I, I thought only Australians or only British could really pull this off. Yeah. Um, with that said, if anyone's listened to this, there's a film called Cooties that came out a couple of years ago with Elijah Wood that has a similar concept, mm-hmm. but um, it's teachers on a playground with zombies, and it's it's a horror comedy too, and that one's uh, really That's good. good. But um, it, it doesn't go as hard as this movie, I, I think. No, no. And I think if you have kids, if you're around kids, if you know kids, I think 
you'll find quite a lot of humor in this. Um, yes. in just, just the way how so much stuff goes over kids heads. Like we were saying before, kind of like if you, if your body language and your face expresses to them that everything's okay, they don't actually quite listen to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Like if you use words that they don't understand, or you talk about topics that they don't understand, all of it goes over their head. And I think like so much this movie emphasized that in a very comical way of, you know, so much adult humor was being passed over the children's heads. Um, So much inappropriate adult content was being passed back and forth over the kids' heads. And then in a lot of cases, some of it was said to the kids and then the kids would just repeat it in the most like plain, factual way. (laughs) Well, what's interesting too is, right, it's kind of how the movie would have had to have been shot. Absolutely. The kids There were zombies around the kids. Right, right? so there's a lot. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of how the movie must have been shot that way. Did you know yeah. that's a lot, this is a fact that I, I looked up here that the director, uh, Abe Forsyth, can yeah. I confirm his name? Yeah, Abe Forsyth, he, direct, he uh, dedicated this movie to his, uh, his own son. Oh, yeah. oh that's sweet. That's sweet. Quest- yeah, I-, I have a question to us. What's that? What movie would you dedicate? What, it can be horror oh, if you want to. What movie do you think would represent uh, our daughter's personality the best? <sighs> Oh, that's a really tough one. I know you have an answer. I do. So I think you should go first. And while you're explaining your answer, I'll try to think of one, but you really put me on the spot there because yeah, uh, that's hard. That's hard. Can you hey, go ahead? No stranger to horror podcast. We put people on the spot. Yeah, I could tell. By I'm, we, it's me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm intimidated. Can I have discussed this with you before? Yeah, of course I could. But uh, anyway, can you think about that. For me, it's Psycho Gorman, uh, the 2020 horror comedy. I think the little girl in Psycho Gorman is uh, the best representation I've ever seen of my two-year-old daughter, even though the little girl in this movie is like eight. But I I feel like that's who my kid's going to be when she grows up, controlling a very strange alien monster and picking on a sibling. I feel like that's her personality. And um, I love her so much for it. And I can't wait till my daughter's eight years old and she finds a crystal that helps her control an alien. I will nurture her as a parent. And um, I hope my wife, who's here, will do the same. But who knows? Um, I may just be the better parent for that reason. Public service announcement. Yeah. If you are single, if you are in a relationship, or if you are married and you are thinking about having children with somebody, have these conversations before you have a kid because that's you just, true. you know, you know, I think that's a bit concerning to know that my husband will um... help my daughter if she finds an alien <laughs> rock that'll help her control an alien. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a non fun little... parent. Mr. Rogers would have done the same thing. Um, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> You're slandering Mr. Rogers. Mr. Here. Rogers believed in helping all sorts of people, aliens as well. So, uh, yeah, he would have. You, uh, yeah, by your own admission. I don't know because that kind of goes against because she doesn't help her brother. She's pretty mean to her brother. She's pretty so. mean to her brother, that whole movie. I Psycho Gorman's a great movie. I'm definitely going to do an episode about it uh, coming up here. So if you haven't seen it, please watch it because I, I just want to support Canadian horror. It's so, so goddamn good. Or maybe the best Canadian horror film that's ever come out, which that's... in my opinion is the best Canadian film that's ever came out. So wow. there you go. That and American Mary, which is also great. That was a great movie. That was a great movie. Yeah. Um, did you find your answer? Okay, my head just kept coming back to the same thing, which meant that I really couldn't get past this yeah. one thing. And this is so niche, so specific to the point where I don't even know if anybody on here has seen it, short of you, Joel, maybe you could put it in the notes. Yeah, it'll be in the show notes, yeah, go on. That video of, of um, it was filmed of a, a, a conflict that happened in public. So it's a real video, viral video. Um, I don't even know if it's viral. I feel like that's putting a really yeah. big amount of um, views on it. But where the um, this boy, teenage boy, is being confronted by an adult at a shoe store. And his older sister stands up and gets in front of him and the man and takes on the entire confrontation. While the, <laughs> the, little, the younger brother kind of steps back in fear. And that viral video to me completely um, sums up not only Ava, but the relationship that she has with her cousin, Ollie, of just 
she's always the one who's going to be the one that kind of just stands up and takes the brunt and is the more of the aggressor in a situation like that an actual movie i can't i can't pinpoint that's, at this that's point. fine that's great that's great that's great <laughs> The only one I can think of is um, Vanilla P. Von Schweetz from um, Great choice. from Wreck It Ralph. Yeah, Just that kind choice. of really full of energy, really full of beans, but kind of determined though. Very determined. determined. Yeah, yeah, doesn't back down, isn't easily affected by the words of others or the actions of others. That to me kind of sums her up. I kind will like say that with this podcast. We have completely nullified anyone ever wanting to babysit our kid. So that's out the oh. window. If anyone's listening to this and they're saying we're friends with us, like, hey, guess what? I would be upset. They've heard this episode and like, hell no, what? Yeah. She sounds she's, like a monster. She's but great. She's very funny. Very she's funny. very funny. She's very entertaining. Um, and the thing is, and, and Joel and I have said this a lot, she has all the personality traits of an adult that I want. I don't want a passive adult that you know just follows authority and does exactly what authoritative people tell her to do because they told her to do that that being said it makes her quite a challenging two-year-old to raise because she doesn't listen to authority she doesn't listen to rules she does her own thing when she wants and she challenges you on everything but she's not badly so, behaved with this. No, set. She's oh, not no. a brat that runs around and destroys things. I mean, she no, runs no. around, but she and she destroys things. But like at home, like yeah, no, she's not a brat. She's she just knows what she wants, and she will argue to get what she wants when she wants it. Um, and she doesn't take no as an easy answer, so finding ways to kind of work around that and, and teach her that she can't always get what she wants when she wants. Um, it's a battle and it's a fight, but I, I like that. I like that it's a battle and a fight instead of a, yes, of course, whatever you say, because you're authoritative. Right. I think I, I, I'd rather that, <laughs> but sometimes I wish she would just just say yeah sometimes just just accept that i said no and just move on yeah <laughs> making it all that over no she's fun she's fun well jenny i think we should wrap up here uh we've talked ava we've talked zombies i have one last zombie question to ask you because i keep okay. saying one more thing throughout this podcast but yeah. i do have a zombie question to ask you because i'm sure and i asked this to nito when she was on the show as well Running or walking with zombies? Which one do you prefer in movies? Oh, running. Yeah, right? Running, I think the... <sighs> walking worked in this one, though. I liked walking. It sure did. Because it would just well, it wouldn't work if it was running zombies. 28 oh days God. later, zombies would have ran through these kids, ran absolutely. through everything. It would have been over in, like, a minute. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, has anybody ever tried to chase a five-year-old? Like, yeah, yeah sure, they're, they're, they're faster yeah. than they are at one or two, but they're not fast, right? And... And I'm in no means a fast athletic runner at all. And I could always catch up with any five-year-old. So I think for sure this movie would have never worked. But overall, if you're going to tell me which one would I rather see on TV or see on the screen, absolutely running. That makes it so much more horrifying. It's scary. It's so scary because there's just... How do you win against that? All right? of the best zombie movies are running zombie movies, unless they're horror comedies, then they're yes. walking zombie movies. There's yes, no, yes, I don't think yes. there is a horror comedy with the running zombies. No, I don't think so. Can't think no. of it. No, not that I can think of. You could argue Dead Set, I suppose, because Dead Set had running zombies and it had comedy, but very bleak. So yeah, I don't think so. I think the whole point of having the kind of walking zombies, at least from my own personal perspective on them, in um comedies like having the walking zombies and comedies i think um you got to get the jokes in right yes. you got to get the jokes you got to make make the point where it's like if you're out of breath running as fast as you possibly can from running zombies you're not going to be able and there's nothing comical about a running zombie, zombie no, right i mean it's scary there's nothing slow, comical about things running at you unless it's going to fall over and be clumsy yeah and the thing with running uh, sorry walking zombies the whole point of it is that they're they're supposed to kind of come across as dumb yeah you know and so 
I think that in that way, that's how they kind of make it comical. It's like, oh, look, like you can bang a pot and they're going to go the wrong way. Right. Or, you know, like if you throw a ball, that kind of thing. Whereas like running zombies aren't just running. I feel like overall their senses are a whole lot more refined and they're a lot more of a intelligent and um, sophisticated predator in general i think it doesn't even just boil down to running i feel like their senses are all a lot more um yeah intense there to quote uh gabriel carter who was on my show a couple episodes ago i feel like i quote this a lot they're more bestial like yes. he used that word bestial describe the monsters he likes and i've been using it ever since because I, I, I love it bestial yeah like for every monster movie i, I think we kind of sit on the same page with that i think that a, a more bestial monster is makes it just more interesting whether it's a werewolf zombie vampire i just want to see them be a monster um but even in this comedy they were like very monstrous and it was like really they were but they even had monstrous moments of like one of my favorite uh, moments was josh gads after and i i have to have this in here before we wrap up josh gads monologue on the rooftop was so goddamn <laughs> funny that and um the store fight that he has with um yes. uh, dave i think it's oh uh, that those two scenes yeah. are so underratedly funny that I, I I think you need to see them just for those two things. The monologue is so funny. And I think it's like goes to put screens what you're saying about like child entertainers that I bet you that part's true. I don't want to spoil oh, it for sure. anyone. But uh the and the fight in the store is just two unathletic guys fighting for their lives, oh, which hilarious. is always funny. Even Absolutely. in real life context, as long as no one gets hurt, two people that don't know how to fight fighting is always comedy to me. Like, I think, like, as long as no one physically gets a two hurt, yeah. whatever, but like people trying to be strong in situations like that, this is more of a survival thing, but guys trying to be strong in situations like that always looks really dumb. And Absolutely. this, they nailed it. These guys were like stapling each other and like pulling hair and it just looked like, yeah, it was so funny to watch those two fight. Hysterical. And I think, um, one of my favorite things that movies do when they're kind of short on time in this, not so much short on time, but like short on time to allocate um, a lot of uh, in-depth character profiling. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really brilliant when they're able to kind of define a character in just a few scenes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they did that so well with Teddy McGiggle was that he wasn't a main character. He was kind of, the bad person like they had to have someone who was going to continually put them at risk and he was that person who was continually putting them at risk um kind of like the evil character yeah. yeah but they just there was so many other things that had to happen in such a short time frame because the movie was only an hour and a half there were so mm -hmm. many other things that had to happen and I think it's so skilled in such a craft to be able to take a side character like Teddy McGiggle, build him up to being this incredibly sweet, funny, charismatic. A creepy though. Remember that the creepy. scene with Lupita? Like Yeah. Well, they, they started very early to kind yes. of like take him down. And I think we all have kind of short of mr rogers yeah we kind of all have this sure of lavar burton gut. too by the way reading Rainbow. yes shut up yeah um uh, this gut feeling that overall male tv not even tv but male kid entertainers are creepy in some way it's like this natural thing we all kind of have um not children necessarily i think that that's a really awful no thing. just creepy in general just like but just creepy like just there's something creepy about a grown man being a child like that kind of like being a baby and using like a baby voice and it it comes across as a lot more normal to see a woman do it because you see women cooing at their babies you see women talking in baby voice all the time but even dads don't do that. Like dads don't talk in baby voice. Dads don't coo at babies. Dads interact with their children on a very different way than mothers do, both with huge amounts of love. It's just a different mm -hmm. way in which they do it. 
Um, so I think like, I think the fact that immediately when they made him creepy with Lupita was kind of just playing on that, playing yeah. on the prejudice that viewers already have for a male childhood entertainer. So what you're saying right now, and I feel like this is a personal and very mean attack towards Blippi, because Blippi, <laughs> he's done nothing wrong. <laughs> uh, yes. Blippi is actually, here's another one, by the way, if you have Amazon and you can watch this, you can go watch Blippi too. I don't, you don't have to, but he's, uh, it's, I'll spell it out for you. It's B-L-I-P-P-I. He spells it out himself too. And I'll put him in the show notes. He uh, <laughs> doesn't even interact with kids and he, horrifies me to no end like i find him to be terrifying he, he's terrifying to me like i think he's one of the scariest you know what's so funny about you say that i can't agree with you I no think way there's there's something i all agree with you when it comes to anthony from the wiggles that anthony I'll from the wiggles you. is the man so take no. that back no my thing with blippy yeah. is i I so view him as like a businessman mm -hmm. who just like realized really early that this was just the best way to make money. And yeah. he's a clown, right? Yeah. Like that's the way I view him is like, he is a clown. He's realized that like, if I put on all this stuff, because you can see him, like, I, I don't know how many episodes you've actually watched, but when One he interacts he's, he's with a adults, yeah, he's so normal. Like he's so like, thank you so much. That's really cool. Thanks for showing us. Like there's a whole episode where he like interacts with a fireman and the whole thing. He's like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then like the minute the man turns away, he goes back into this like very silly sing song character. Well, for some inside I baseball, think, I, I did look him up and he actually, uh, he's like a like digital marketing and SEO experience. And that's what like he just translated into. He's a, he's a genius. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like that to me makes him a little bit less creepy is that he's just willing to hone in on this market whereas like anthony from the wiggles no disrespect thinks he's a rock star <laughs> he does right yeah. he thinks he's a rock star he thinks he's elvis but for children and to me like that's just so much creepier just this like sense of like you think you're all that just because you perform for children I don't know like it's one thing if you're like oh this makes money I'll do what it takes to make money because whatever the world's weird and you know he kind of like just figured out this weird loophole in the system to make money and I feel like I respect that whereas like Anthony really believes like he's the second coming he uh um, <laughs> messiah we talked about this though we talked about like how the energy on the wiggle show that other people when they go on there Oh, wild. like it, it's just compete. a very weird energy yeah 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 you can't compete with that you can't and the fact that they keep that up at all times and, and anthony's been on the wiggles for a year years. he controls the energy right he's the yeah. director he controls the energy so yeah as if anyone thought i was actually yelling at my wife uh let's start off on two things she would never let me and uh <laughs> number two, <laughs> and number two um i don't like anthony from the wiggles so she, she knew i was joking i just want to yeah. clarify that um but uh yeah he he controls the energy he directs all the episodes and yeah. uh we're really deep into the wiggles apparently yeah but well, I, feel I think like there's just a lot of parallels right that's the thing is that when you when you see a childhood um entertainer on the Australian movie, your mind too. yeah your mind automatically starts to go to um others others you thought of like my mind of course always goes to Wee herman of course and i'm like he's kind of the epitome of um Speaking of childhood entertainers, I feel like right now and also in the notes, you have to talk about happy. Like you don't have to necessarily go on it, but if you're if you're ooh, looking ooh, for a yes. horror that also kind of dives in on the the childhood entertainer being creepy and kind of being a bit nefarious, so to speak. I feel like nefarious is a very kind way of putting very it. Um, yeah, that's another one, and I think that all kind of plays upon the prejudice that so many people already have towards male entertainers and that's not to say that that's founded in anything like how mm -hmm. many like we're talking about mr rogers we're talking about raffi we're talking about LeVar mr Burton. dresser um fred penner yeah and like so many of them are really get into it for the right reasons and are really just such kind-hearted sweet people and i think it's unfair to kind of lump them all together because but i feel like mr rogers and i feel like lavar Burton, and i feel like uh, fred penner i feel like that all of those those men that did it and this is what makes them not creepy in my opinion 
they didn't do what you just said. They didn't do the overacting kind of yes. like that child voice. They all just kind yeah. of seemed like they seemed like guys Absolutely. who just picked up on the street, like, hey, can you entertain my kids for a little bit? And they're like, yeah, sure. And then Absolutely. they just killed at it. Like, yeah, Burton, they just kind of reminded me of those, like, 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 yeah, the grandpa, the yes, grandpa that yes. like they got was just right a good grandpa. That's yeah. it, right? Like, that's who they are. And yeah, you're right. Like, it's the clown energy that I don't like it. Like, Mr. Rogers, and I don't know if anybody's seen the Mr. Rogers documentary, but um, I'll put it in the show. yeah, from everybody, like even down to his kids, down to his wife, down to every single person that interacted with him, everybody said that's who he is. Mm -hmm. Who you see on TV is who he is. And I think that's what's creepy about this um, clown like behavior is that why are you doing it and who are you? And I think that's like the kind of, you watch them and you have this mistrust already of like, we know you're not the clown. So who are you? you right? And I think, him. sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, no, I didn't mean to interrupt, I in, interrupt you there. I was just gonna say you're making a very good point about the clown because on that same token, you know who I found creepy that was a woman that was an entertainer? Um, big comfy couch. Yes, so true. So creepy. So true. Yeah. So creepy. And I yeah. and when you said clown, I'm like, that's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. That whole clown entertainer. Yeah. Because if you're putting on a, a character that's so exaggerated and so clearly not who you are, I think the um ability to believe any other story about you is easy. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> this is gonna sound so awful but uh, speaking of clowns trump is a good example oh we're getting political but but when you put on such a fake um persona that people have already been able it goes for anybody right like when any actor, any politician, mm -hmm. anybody when like, I mean, if you want to go political, we could even talk about Trudeau and what's happening right now, right? When you put on a fake persona, a fake level of care, concern, I'm going to do what's right. And then you don't do it or you do the opposite. It's just about trust, right? Like you've mm -hmm. just blown the level of trust that that's who you are. So it's so easy to start to believe rumors or truths or whatever, any story that's made about you because we've already found holes in the persona in which you've created. And I think that's why it's so easy to believe that these clown-like childhood entertainers, it's easy to believe anything because clearly you're not that. Nobody is that. Nobody is that clown. So to believe that you're an alcoholic who actually hates children is not that hard to believe versus somebody like Mr. Rogers when everybody that knew him personally, everybody that ever interacted with him, everybody had the same story of that's who he is. And you hear from everybody that that's the truth. When you find out some other story, it's kind of a little bit harder to believe that that's possible. Right? It's just, it's just I think that's what is going well, so well right now with comedians and podcasts. We're getting to see yeah. both sides and we're getting yeah. to see their stand-up comedy aspect, which is Absolutely. this beautiful act, but we actually get to see that their personality on a podcast, which is very similar, but not a hundred percent like yeah. um, the same, right? The, the more the yeah. honesty they have on podcasts, which yeah. is like all I listen to is comedy podcasts, right? Cause I, I just love the uh, minutia of like how comedy is made. And I, and I just yeah. love to hear that, but it's the same thing, right? It's that you don't have to wonder, but with, yeah. with like childhood entertainers um, that are clownish, you have to wonder. And it just makes you feel uncomfortable, which is great why you brought up happy because happy, yes. I think nailed it in the most beautiful horror way yeah. for the love of God, them canceling that show hurt oh. me. Oh yeah. I know. That hurt it's me. Like such that hurt a me. spot. Yeah. yeah. Sci-fi. If you're listening to this and I'm so heartbroken over you canceling that show and the show Deadly Class in the same year. Yeah. And then I think after that, you canceled Krypton. I don't know why sci-fi has something personally against me, but. I know. I, I just feel personal. like it's personal. It's mean. It's cruel. And um, 
I like, just hope I never see you in real life because I'll fight you. I'll <laughs> fight you, Mr. Sci-Fi. <laughs> Mr. Sci-Fi, uh, we are in the niche market that you are breaking up right now. Yeah, so yeah. Our, our marriage has been rocky since you uh, yeah. <laughs> broke up. And I shows. bet you didn't expect us to bring you down on a podcast. So <laughs> here you I've are, been... punishment. <laughs> oh, yeah. The No Stranger to Horror podcast is coming for you. Oh, before, okay, I've said like we're going to wrap up. But before I do, I just want to state something and a big thank you to my wonderful wife, uh thank you so much for the idea of the title of this podcast oh, and i wanted to say it to out. you i wanted to say it to you on the show um the no stranger horror idea was jenny's idea because i think originally what i was going to go with is like horror is dead or something like that but everything to do with like no stranger to horror i think you can't you came up with the uh intro too you said yeah just say like hi um, my name is uh, George Brewster and I'm no stranger to horror that was her idea and I think it's a it was a it was a brilliant idea and thank you so much oh, you're, really welcome. That. you're welcome I hope people actually like it and they're not like oh she's to blame for this everyone's like drama. horror is dead that was the idea before this oh you my god why didn't you go with that it's a great idea why didn't you share what with that I just have to change the name of the podcast um yeah go back yeah. and re-edit everything Jenny I imagine just because I know you personally I think I do. Um, okay, I hope so. Well, I hope so too. Maybe I imagine that you, you're not going to want to promote your social media on here. If you do, do you want more <laughs> followers? Is that what you do? If not, you can promote something else you just watched or something that, uh, that inspired you. You know what I am going to promote because I feel like it was just a really great show. And I, a lot of people are already saying it's a really great show. Check out Behind Her Eyes on Netflix because Ooh. I thought that was fantastic. Okay necessarily say horror kind of thriller but creepy super creepy um loved it because it was one of those shows that you did not see the ending coming until it was happening and personally those are my favorite shows or movies is when you're completely blindsided um nothing more than I hate than when you're 15 minutes into a movie sorry rom-coms but when you're 15 minutes into a movie you know exactly what's going to happen at the end drives me crazy but behind her eyes um no idea until about the last 20 minutes of the show that it was going to go the way that it went and uh yeah that's yeah. about all I that's all I have to promote it's all I've watched lately that I loved besides little monsters that was a great movie but yeah. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely yeah. put that in the show notes. And if I get the time, I'll check it out. And then, and I yeah. say, if I get the time, because you know where all my time spent. That's right. So. Well, <laughs> make that a priority because it was great. I will. Um, I will. Yeah. And on my end, I will just promote what I usually do. You can find me at West Coast Strange on at, for both the uh, podcast, sorry, on, for both the Facebook page as well as the Instagram. Um, Follow me more on Instagram, I'd say, because the Facebook page, I, I love you guys, but I, I feel like I'm aiming more towards Instagram. That has more to do with the algorithm, but that's neither here nor there. Anyways. He also has fire stories on Instagram. So. Oh, thank you. Say thank you so you'll much. get that more than you will on, on Facebook. So that's true. Instagram's better to figure it out. It's much better. That's true. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much. I will see you in about five seconds when we go to have. <laughs> breakfast and talk about this yeah, and well i i have to drive home for my summer home it's first, true so you you're might the, have to wait <laughs> and you're the first guest i'm gonna say this to you i love you I um love you. thank you <laughs> i'll see you later and thank you guys so much for listening and i hope you got a kick out of this and be kind and watch more horror see everybody Great. later bye <laughs>